essentially is to provide kind of a broad survey of uh, social media use risks um, in, in business and, and, and the workplace. And then also to cover some of the insurance implications. Um, obviously, uh, with risk comes uh, hopefully some, some insurance coverage to, uh, to, to back it up. So um, it's gonna be a, you know, a very broad overview. There's obviously a lot to um, both the uh, risks as well as uh, the insurance issues, more than we could cover in a 50-minute session. Uh, but we are certainly open to questions uh, and, and uh, contacting us you know, after the presentation if, you, if you'd like some more uh, information or, or, or detail. So today we're going to identify key social media risks that businesses face, discuss uh, common insurance policies that provide coverage for those risks and, and may not provide coverage for those risks, and then highlight some typical exclusions and limitations that may restrict um, the, the coverage. Um, so let's start at the beginning. When we first began presenting this, um, this topic, maybe uh, five or six years ago, we actually did have to instruct the audience as to what social media was. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, I think everybody is, is, is very familiar with all the you know, various social media platforms. And it's you know, social networking sites, content communities, microblogs, blogs, and, and, and writing sites are, are the, you know, the principal uses of, of social media. Um, and you know many of the uh, platforms you you would certainly be uh, familiar with. We have some statistics about use that are relevant uh, in demonstrating just how prolific um, social media use is, and, and therefore um, the, the the associated risks. Yeah. So um, just to, to sort of put this in context, there's around seven and a half billion people in, in the world. About four billion of them are on the internet. About 3.2 billion people are active users of social media. Um, there's about 5.1 billion people who are uh, mobile users of the internet, and of them, there's almost 3 billion who are active users of social media on, on their phones. So clearly, there's a lot of people out there, and a lot of them are using social media. Um, common uh, platforms that, that people use, Facebook, there's about 2.1 billion people on, on Facebook. Uh, YouTube has about 1.5, Instagram 800 million, uh, Twitter 330 million. So there's a lot of people who are using these platforms, a lot of the really popular ones, and, and obviously Facebook kind of dominates the, the, the field here. But you know, given how much, if anybody remembers MySpace, uh, these things tend to change pretty quickly. So Facebook is on top now, but who knows what the next, uh, you know, the next big platform is going to be. Uh, so by age group, not probably not surprisingly, younger people tend to be the most uh, prominent users of, of social media. Um, you know, ninety percent of people eighteen to twenty nine are, are active on social media, and it, and it steps down a little bit as you get to the, the next age group. And then, but even sixty five plus, you've got forty three percent of of people age sixty five plus who are active users of, of social media. So really, across age groups, there's a pretty broad use. Social media, um, and this is in time for the Fourth of July for all of you who are um, patriotic. We're, we're number one. Uh, Americans spend uh, the most time on social media, uh, over just over two hours a day, um, which kind of blows my mind as someone with a full-time job and and two young kids. I don't know how people find the time to do that, but apparently, uh, people we average about two hours a day on on social media. Um, so you might be wondering, well, where do they find that time, you know, two hours a day when people have jobs and, and families and all these things? Well, a lot of people are actually on social media at work. Um, and, uh, you know, whether, you're, whether you like it or not as an employer, people are going to be accessing social media from work. And, and this, uh, this is a Pew Research uh, survey which talks about some of the reasons why people go on social media at work. Um, <laughs> Taking a mental break from work, I guess this would be the, the cat video category of, of social media <laughs> use. Um, connect with friends and family, make or, uh, make or support professional connections, get information that helps them solve problems at work. I'm a little personally dubious about that answer. That's, I think, the answer you give if you think your boss is going to look at the uh, response to the survey. Um, build or strengthen personal relationships, learn about someone they work with. Um, those are, those are sorts of things that people would do uh, while they're at work uh, on social media. So with all that social media use, um, including all that social media use at work, 
that raises the next question, which is, well, as an employer, uh, what are the risks that you face because of all that social media use? So over uh, <coughs> many hundreds of years, a number of common law torts have evolved that uh, addresses the <coughs> risk associated with human interaction and with social media use. Um, that human interaction um, has exponentially increased. Um, all of our online uh, communications um, have the capacity to be global rather than just conversations over the backyard fence. Um, these are the, the common law torts that, that existed you know, prior to social media use and which uh, are, are now becoming um, you know, claims that are being asserted as a result of, of, of social media use. And so we've got uh, defamation, um, harassment, and, and particularly with, with social media, uh, cyberbullying, um, invasion of privacy claims, employment-related claims, false advertising and intellectual property infringement, all areas that um, you know, are, are traditional torts in, in US law uh, now you know, potentially um, you know, exponentially uh, increased as a result of, of, of social media. And so we'll take a look at um, defamation first. Um, this is a, a, a legal definition. It's a, uh, a statement is defamatory if it tends to harm the, the reputation of another as to lower him in the estimation of the community or uh, deter third persons from associating or dealing with him. There, there are various uh, defenses to defamation claims or uh, protections available to journalists, for example. Uh, and some safe harbors for website operators under the Communication Decency Act. Um, but uh, this is an area where we uh, see a lot of uh, uh, litigation. So just to give you a flavor of some of the kinds of claims that social media use uh, produces, um, we have a number of cases reported in, in, in various jurisdictions throughout the US. Um, I'll, I'll just cover some of the very basic you know, facts of the claims just to give you sort of a flavor for that. So uh, the case out of New Jersey in 2011, Too Much Media versus Hale. Um, in this case, the plaintiff created a software um, platform for adult entertainment websites to track access to affiliated websites. Um, and it, the defendant had posted defamatory comments about the plaintiff on a message board, insinuating that the plaintiff was involved in criminal activity and had profited from a security breach of its software. The defendant argued that a state shield law designed to protect journalists from reporting news applied to the claim and therefore uh, there, there could be no liability. Um, in that particular case, the court uh, disagreed, finding that an online message board is not the type of news outlet protected by the statute. Um, another interesting case was Bach and Hatch LLC versus McGuire Woods. Um, in this case, uh, the law firm of Wire Woods had posted a legal update on its firm uh, blog about a case in which the, the Bach and Hatch firm represented um, a group of plaintiffs. The article posted by McGuire Woods discussed how the uh, Bach and Hatch firm was supposed to keep certain information confidential, had allegedly used the information in property to, improperly to file a number of class action lawsuits, and uh, caused the court ultimately to rule against Bach and Hatch in that, in that case. Um, the Bach and Hatch firm sued McGuire Woods for defamation, claiming that McGuire Woods misrepresented the facts of the case on its blog. So again, a seemingly innocuous you know, blog post about uh, a, a case that the firm was involved in turns into a defamation suit. Um, Jones versus Dirty World Entertainment Records, LLC. Uh, here, um, it's important to note that the Communication Decency Act provides a safe harbor for website uh, operators for comments posted um, on their websites. Uh, however, the safe harbor does not apply if the website operator encourages someone to make defamatory statements or joins in the statements on the website. Um, so in this particular case, the court held the website owner um, who added his own comments ratifying or adopting a defamatory post by another uh, loses the protection of the, of the safe harbor. Um, so you can see that there are um, a number of instances where seemingly you know, ordinary use of social media uh, produces uh, a, you know, a, a potential for a, a defamation. And the, the next risk that, that we talk about is, is cyberbullying, which I'm sure you've all probably read a lot about and heard a lot about, um, particularly recently. Um, cyberbullying is, uh, is 
really just a form of sort of traditional bullying, I guess, that takes place over a lot of times uh, social media. So you can have you can have text messages and things like that, but you see a lot of cyberbullying on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, on Twitter. Maybe less on Facebook these days because as I've been reading, it's it's only people my age and up who use Facebook anymore. Apparently, uh, young kids don't, but. Um, but you do see some of that there and, and on some of these other social media platforms. Um, there's no claim called cyberbullying. You know, you don't sue someone for, for cyberbullying in that name. Um, there's actually a lot of, of different types of, of common law claims or statutory claims that could be brought um, out of cyberbullying activities. Um, so if, it, if the cyberbullying has a, a sort of racial or, or gender component to it, it could fall within federal or state hate crimes um, or anti-discrimination laws. There are also a lot of common law claims. Uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress is one of them that you see a lot. Um, reckless infliction of emotional distress. Um, just plain negligence um, can come up in these, in these situations. Um, so some of the cases that we have to, to sort of highlight how, this, how these types of claims come about. The, um, the DC versus RR case, was uh, a 15-year-old kid had created a website to promote his music career, and some of his classmates had gone onto the website and gone into the comments section of the blog and, and posted <coughs> homophobic comments about him and, and made threats uh, of violence to him. Um, the uh, uh, the student had then sued the other the other uh, classmates, um, you know, claiming that this was a cyberbullying activity, um, and the court ultimately held that the types of comments that were made on the website were not protected speech under the First Amendment because the First Amendment doesn't protect uh, threats of violence. That's not, that's not free speech. That's not something that's protected. Um, the uh, State of Olson case, uh, this was another sad case that involved a student who actually committed suicide after uh, being bullied online by classmates. Um, the family sued the school district uh, for failing to investigate and take remedial steps to, um, to address the complaints that the parents and the student had made uh, before the student had committed suicide. Um, and actually, not, they sued not only for negligence, but they sued the school district for wrongful death. And, and so um, a wrongful death claim is a, is a, you know, can be a, a really large claim, um, and they were basically saying that the school district was responsible, at least in part, for, for the child's suicide. So that sort of counsels that as an organization, you know, you need to be uh, at least somewhat aware if people bring to you, you know, something to your attention um, that someone is engaging in this type of activity on social media, um, you know, you, you probably don't want to just sit by and let it happen. Um, because, you know, in that case, the school district um, could be found to owe a duty to the, the child and the parents to, uh, to, to investigate and try to correct that behavior. Um, the Harvey v. MIT case is, is an interesting one. Uh, MIT had a class that they taught online and they created a Facebook group uh, for that class where students could interact with each other and interact with the professor. Uh, the professor um, took it upon himself to start engaging in intimate and sexual uh, uh, communications with one of the students on the Facebook group. Um, that proceeded uh, throughout the semester and towards the end of the semester, the professor insinuated to the student that if, if the communications didn't continue, the student was not going to get a favorable uh, result in the class. Um, obviously that's sort of, everyone here understands that that sort of behavior is inappropriate, but what happened in that case is the student sued MIT, and the student sued MIT for, um, for negligence, um, for allowing the professor to do that, and for not being aware of the activity, and, and, and not um, policing the, the Facebook group that MIT had created for this online. So those are just some examples of, of sort of harassment and, and cyberbullying activity that can take place on social media and how that can, you know, those types of claims can be asserted against not just the person who is doing the harassing, but also the organization that, that employs them. Um, so the, the next uh, list we have is invasion of privacy. So invasion of privacy is uh, kind of a, a broad catch-all for a number of different types of claims that could be brought, and, and this is sort of the, the legal, legal definition. Um, there's four distinct torts, which are claims that you could bring uh, for invasion of privacy, 
it, it needs to go back a long time, which is why some of the language is a little arcane, but intrusion upon seclusion, appropriation of name or likeness, publicity given in private life, publicity placing a person in false light. We could spend a whole day talking about each of those, but the general takeaway is these types of claims, really what they amount to is a claim that you invaded my right to be left alone. And that's what, that's generally what these invasion of privacy torts deal with. Um, the social media sites themselves, so your Twitters, your Facebook, um, your Instagram, they're typically immune from uh, lawsuits because of these claims under the Communications Decency Act, which essentially gives a safe harbor to, um, as Kevin mentioned in the context of one of the other claims, it gives a safe harbor to the operators of the website or the app, um, basically saying that they shouldn't be responsible for policing what happens on the app. Um, but that, as Kevin mentioned in the earlier case, that doesn't apply if they're actually actively commenting on that or, or posting their own thoughts um, you know, on something that someone else put on there. Um, and it also does not extend to protect people who make the comments on those websites. So if, if you go onto Facebook and you post something, you're not entitled to the safe harbor under the, the Communications Decency Act. Um, the, these claims typically involve somebody who posts personal information about another person on social media without their consent. So the, the Yaf v. Fairview Clinics case is another case with uh, some pretty egregious facts. This case, uh, an employee of a health clinic accessed uh, without authorization the health records of a patient who came in uh, because she uh, knew the patient uh, outside of, of the context of, of the health clinic. Um, in the health records, the employee learned that the patient was being treated for a sexually transmitted disease, and the employee took it upon herself to go and tell the patient's husband, who presumably was not aware of that or the activity that led to the sexually transmitted disease. Um, but where social media comes in is the employee thought that wasn't enough, but also went out and um, allegedly created a MySpace page called um, Rotten Candy, the, the patient's name was Candace, and posted her uh, personal health information onto the MySpace page. Um, so, <laughs> are you going to take questions uh, as you go, or do you want to wait until the end? Sure, feel free. If you guys have any questions as we go, feel free to. to I was just, I was curious in that respect about personal identifying information, simple address, not not uh, animated comments about. By the way, so and so lives at. If you want to go and protest his house. Sure. Well, I, I mean, I I would hesitate to say because the laws are different everywhere, but um, you know, that potentially I suppose could be could be actionable. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I I wonder whether um, there would have to be some you know ill motive behind it, so the, the information is. itself might, might be innocuous, uh, directory information, information that somebody might find in a phone book, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if it's posted for information purposes and isn't intended to harass or, or, or you know, serve as a, a rallying call to protest or something like that, um, then I would say probably not. Um, on the other hand, if you could show that there's some ill motive or, or, or bad intent behind it, um, perhaps it, it, it could be. Is there a, uh, any requirement in these claims to uh, seek some administrative relief first before resorting? You know, going to court only publicizes the dispute all right. over again. Is there a so case? there's no administrative body that would that would be available to arbitrate or resolve or even investigate these claims. Um, these these and I was invasion of referring to a. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, you. sure. A specific body, but the equivalent of that in administrative law. The, the, the yeah. Facebook, all these, the platforms have a requirement. Oh, for I see what you're saying. For, for doing that, rectifying. So there may be, the and I'm not, I'm not aware of all of the you know platforms, you know rules and regulations. My my guess is that all of the platforms have some sort of mechanism for appealing or requesting that certain information be taken down um, and, there, and, and, and have you know, thresholds of, of proof that are required to establish that the content you know, is inappropriate or, or harassing in some way. In, in addition, I think that there are um, uh, 
internal policies that you know result in the deletion of, of content or the blocking of content just 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 for the content itself. So um, you know without even the you know the request being made. So yes, I think at the at the platform level, you know the the the, the, the Facebook or Twitter level, um, the answer is is yes. Out, outside of that, um, the recourse would be to the Um, so, the, the, as I said, the Yak case is a particularly egregious example, but um, there are other contexts where, you know, as, as you said, posting personally identifying information or other types of personal information about someone online without their consent could, could lead to potential liability. That, that sort of brings us to the, the, the context of, of, you know, social media <coughs> use in the workplace and employment-related claims. And, so I think it's it's important to sort of understand, you know, how is social media used in the workplace? How do employers use it? How do employees use it? Um, employers will, you know, regularly engage in investigating, you know, credentials or qualifications of job applicants. You know, we've we've all been, you know, warned not to, you know, post content on our Facebook site that that would cause us to become unemployable, right? Uh, and we know that because employers are, 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 are watching. Um, they're using uh, <coughs> social media to make hiring decisions and even to track uh, employee behaviors. Employees use it to communicate with family and friends, with coworkers, and also um, you know, to promote their employer's products or, or potentially to demote their competitors' uh, products or services. Um, with that kind of use in mind, it should not be surprising that there a number of traditional employment-related claims arise, you know, from social media use, including harassment claims, discrimination, hostile work environment, unfair trade practices claims, uh, tortious interference, and 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 you know, privacy claims, including the kinds of claims that that, that David was just uh, speaking about. Um, so we do have a, a number of cases uh, that address. Uh, and provide good examples of the kinds of claims that arise out of social media use uh, in the workplace. The overarching theme, though, is that um, in the employment context, uh, where employers um, have traditionally been responsible for monitoring the workplace, which is typically the four walls, uh, you know, that, that constitute the, you know, the physical uh, space, now is everywhere, including our living rooms. Um, Blackie versus Continental uh, Airlines, uh, a New Jersey case from 2000, um, is, an, is an interesting example. In this case, uh, a female pilot at Continental Airlines uh, sued the airline for sexual harassment and a hostile uh, work environment after fel fellow workers posted allegedly harassing gender-based messages on a message board that uh, was made available uh, to Continental employees uh, through Continental's computer system. The court held in that case that Continental couldn't simply, sim simply sit by and ignore the content on the board. Uh, it, it actually had a responsibility to manage it because it was their uh, platform. So in, in that case, it's, it's interesting to me that the workplace now uh, extends to this you know, virtual uh, space. Amir Jabbar versus uh, Travel Services Inc., a, a case out of Puerto Rico in 2010, um, here, uh, an employee was sued claiming hostile work environment against a former employee after coworkers had allegedly uh, posted racist comments about a picture that was taken of her at a company picnic uh, and posted on Facebook. The court held that the incident was too isolated to constitute a hostile work environment and that the employer had promptly investigated and took remedial measures, including blocking employee access to Facebook. The important point, though, is that uh, absent those defenses, the claim might have proceeded. Um, so again, you have uh, the workplace extending onto Facebook. Um, Elling versus Monmouth Ocean Hospital Services Corp. Uh, here, a plaintiff was suspended from her job as a nurse for comments she had posted uh, on a Facebook page. Um, here, the plaintiff had limited access to her page uh, only to her friends. Uh, but one of her friends was a coworker who read a post she had made about a shooting in Washington. Um, the post insinuated that the shooter should have been left for dead by the paramedic, uh, and the employer ultimately uh, suspended the plaintiff 
for demonstrating deliberate disregard for patient safety. So again, this employee uh, seemingly, you know, making you know private comments uh, on a Facebook page that are um, perceived as in dereliction of her, you know, responsibilities as a nurse, uh, end up, you know, uh, resulting in suspension because, um, you know, among her friends is, is a coworker. Again, the workplace extends to uh, social media platform. And finally, uh, Jackson versus Walgreen Company. Here, an employee was fired uh, after posting a pornographic video on a coworker's Facebook page, and in a post referred uh, or referenced two female coworkers uh, in reference to the video, even though the, the coworkers you know did not appear in the video. Um, Walgreens terminated the employee, uh, uh, citing its own social media policy. Um, the court found the termination was proper as the violation of the social media policy was employee misconduct. So again, um, the, the workplace moves beyond the brick and mortar uh, into this virtual space, into our living rooms. Yeah, and I think one point I would add about that case is they, you know, the fact that they had the social media policy really gave them a, a valid basis for for the inter the termination. So it was a, you know, it was a termination for cause um, because they had that policy to, to fall back on. So um, this brings us to another area. Um, potential liability and that is false advertising claims. I have a quick question. Yes, sure. Um, so is, can a, an employer make a hiring decision with information that is found on a Facebook page? Is, is that, yes. that is okay? So, yes, yeah, so so the, the only caveat I would add to that is is by having access and, and, and looking at their, their social media site, you may get <laughs> information that could lead you to make a hiring decision based on an inappropriate factor that, that would be a violation. So if you go on someone's social media uh, page and you find out things about their ethnicity, their gender, their, their sexual orientation, or some other protected class, um, that type of information, and then you make an employment decision based on that, then you would be just as liable as if you made that determination without the social media. Um, so you, there's no blanket prohibition on using social media, but you can't use it in an inappropriate way. So that, that brings us to uh, false advertising. So in 2018, it was estimated that social and digital media generated $237 billion of all advertising spent worldwide. Um, it's, it, this, this, this exponential growth in, in social media for advertising uh, really is attributable to uh, some of the statistics we saw at the beginning of the pre presentation. You know, number one, social media attracts a, a, a key advertising demographic, which is the 18 to 25 to 30 year olds. Um, it allows uh, advertisers obviously to target specific groups with similar, similar uh, characteristics and preferences. We've all seen how uh, the, the pop-up ads and uh, other advertisements that, that are fed to us um, are carefully tailored to um, our own uh, personal preferences. Um, and it allows the companies to interact you know, personally with their, their, uh, their targets um, and in real time. Um, as you can imagine, um, the, this prolific use of, of uh, social media for advertising uh, also produces its own unique uh, risks. Um, one such case, Doctors Association uh, versus Quip Holding, uh, is, is, a, is an interesting case. Here, uh, the sandwich chain Subway had brought suit against its competitor Quiznos for false advertising under the Lanham Act uh, in connection with Quiznos's web-based uh, contest that asked consumers to submit videos demonstrating why their product was superior to uh, Subway's product. Um, Subway alleged that the advertisements falsely portrayed Subway sandwiches and that Quiznos was responsible for their content even though the videos were made by consumers themselves. And that's of course because ultimately those videos were posted to um, Quiznos website. Blue Star Management uh, versus the Annex Club. Here the, the plaintiff and defendant each owned rooftop clubs that overlooked Wrigley Field uh, from which customers uh, were enticed to uh, uh, frequent to watch uh, the games. The plaintiff alleged that the defendant had made false advertisements by paying for uh, sponsored ads on social media that advertised the defendant's club 
uh, using a picture of the plaintiff's car. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, that was intended to deceive uh, and, and, and create the impression that, that the defendant's club was as nice as the plaintiff's. Uh, vitamins online versus Heartwise. Uh, here a vitamin company sued for false advertisement for alleging uh, that inst uh, allegedly instructing employees to post uh, inflated reviews of products for sale on, on Amazon. Um, we see a, a lot of, of those kinds of claims. And then uh, Nunes versus Rushton. Uh, here uh, an author uh, sued the defendant, also an author, for allegedly creating uh, sock puppet accounts to post negative reviews of the author's books on various online platforms. Um, so as you can see, uh, false advertising is, is yet another uh, area of, of potential risk. Sure, and, and so the next, uh, the next category, um, and hopefully by the time we're done with all this, everyone's terrified. Uh, <laughs> the risks there are, um, and then we'll get on to the, the good side, which is you, you may have um, some coverage for it, but before we get there, um, we'll talk about intellectual property claims. So these are uh, copyright, patent, trademark, trade dress, um, trade dress is just, it's, it's uh, essentially, it's, it, the way I like to think about it is, if anybody here has an iPhone, it comes in that nice sleek you know, white packaging and you don't have to see the Apple logo to know that that's an Apple phone because of the way they package it up. Um, that's the trade dress, um, it, one example of it, it can be broader than that, but you know, if Nokia started selling their phones in really sleek white packaging like that, you know, they could potentially be liable for trade dress violations, even if they don't use the Apple um, so social media is sort of a fertile ground for these types of claims, uh, and, and the reason why is that it allows people to really easily share other people's intellectual property. Um, you could send videos and photographs and other files you know, to publish them to the whole world uh, you know, with the click of a button. So uh, an example of a, of a copyright claim, this is uh, HarperCollins v. Gawker, which I don't know if anybody remembers the late, the late Gawker. Um, uh, who uh, frequently comes up in the case law for <laughs> all sorts of <laughs> violations of claims. They tend to be a popular target. Um, this was a case where uh, the publisher of Sarah Palin's book uh, had sued them because Gawker had posted 21 pages of the book to their, uh, their blog um, and with minimal uh, commentary. It was really just kind of a cut and paste and, and here's a, an excerpt from a book. And they did that without permission and before the book was, was actually published uh, and at the preliminary stages of the of the case uh, the publisher had argued that you know this we want an injunction we want to make them take it down while we litigate the case so there will be an immediate harm so they should take it down right now before we even litigate the issue Gawker argued that they were entitled to put it up there because it was fair use fair use is is a doctrine that um, allows you to use copyrighted material under certain circumstances, so educational uh, purposes is one. Um, there's some journalism uh, you know, exceptions that, that allows you to use copyrighted material. Um, satire is one that, that could be a fair use. Uh, the court in that case held that at least at the preliminary stages that Gawker was unlikely to prevail on their fair use argument because they had actually um, posted it almost verbatim with very minimal commentary, and so the court said, you know, you're gonna have a hard time establishing fair use when you didn't really do any of the things that would constitute fair use, like you know, put something newsworthy about that or do some sort of satire or something like that. Um, trademark, uh, this is, this is the, uh, the Fortune High Tech Marketing Inc., the Isaacs case. This was a company that, um, they operated a, a direct sales company that marketed products using a, a series of, of uh, independent representatives. Um, they sued an, a former independent representative who had gone out and created a social networking site of his own, um, targeting other independent representatives for the company. And on his social networking site, he had used the company's name, used their logo and, um, to promote his own sort of competing social networking site. And the company sued him uh, for trademark infringement for, for essentially misappropriating their name and, and trying to make money off of the goodwill that that name had generated. Um, so those are just a couple examples. These come up a, a lot in, in social media claims, um, uh, but those are the two, two of the primary ones would be copyright and trademark. So you've been sued. 
what next? Um, we're going to take a look at some of the um, more uh, likely coverages applicable to uh, businesses facing these, these types of liabilities. Just want to make a comment that obviously there's also personal risk and, and uh, parallel coverages in you know, homeowners policies, but we're not going to cover that today since we're addressing this from the you know, business side. Um, and, and, and so we're going to look at some standard uh, insurance services office uh, policy forms for commercial general liability, um, employer liability, and also uh, cyber liability, and just cover um, in very you know, general terms um, where there are uh, possible coverages for the claims and, and, and possible limitations of coverages for the claims. I guess maybe uh, before I get into that, I wonder, um, do we have risk managers or folks involved with, with claims or insurance in the room? Okay, so um, hopefully we'll hit on some, some themes that, that uh, are near and dear. And, and we begin with um, the, the commercial general liability coverage and, and, and the coverage A. There's, there's two coverages under, under a, a CGL policy, and we'll touch on both of those. So the, the insuring agreement under uh, the, the standard uh, CGL form is to pay those sums that the insured becomes legally obligated to pay <coughs> as damages because of property damages um, arising out of an occurrence. And so you have there um, the, the, the basic um, ISO uh, uh, standard uh, insuring agreement. Uh, so the, the three elements for coverage are bodily injury, property damage, and an occurrence. Um, the issues that arise in the context of the kinds of torts that we've discussed involving uh, <coughs> arising out of social media use um, are, uh, you know, first of all, is a, is a bodily injury claim alleged? And, and here, um, often, it turns on whether this is a claim involving, um, you know, some, some physical harm versus mental anguish. So Dave spoke uh, earlier about cyberbullying claims. Often, uh, those kinds of claims are not accompanied by any physical injury. It's all, uh, you know, mental uh, anguish or, or, or mental harm. Um, the standard definition um, in the ISO policy form is bodily injury, sickness, or disease sustained by a person, including death resulting from any of these at any time. Um, a number of courts throughout the, 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 the uh, country have considered whether that definition includes mental anguish, um, including the New York courts. Uh, in the Lavenant decision, the, the, the Court of Appeals concluded that it does, uh, but there are a number of jurisdictions that conclude that it does not. Um, so in the context of, of um, uh, claims arising out of you know, social media use, um, that's, that's, the, that's the, a, a principal issue. Um, it's, it's particularly interesting in the context of suicide, right? Because um, obviously there is uh, physical harm involved there's, or, or death involved. Um, and, and whether, um, you know, non-physical contact, but, you know, a campaign of, of mental harassing that leads to suicide, you know, falls within that, that definition. And my guess is that that's an issue that we will see um, litigated. Then, uh, absent, you know, bodily injury, um, there's the possibility of coverage under coverage A if you can establish that there's uh, some property damage. Um, Again, the, the CGL form uh, has a definition for that term. It means physical injury to tangible property or loss of use of tangible property that has not been physically injured. And the key to this definition is that the property that is um, harmed or damaged must be tangible. Um, in the context of uh, social media liabilities, um, you know, the question always is, you know, whether, for example, you know, copyright infringement um, would be considered, you know, tangible property. I believe the conclusion that is no, um, but you can imagine, you know, in the context of social media use, you're talking about virtual content, you know, data uh, and other media, um, and so that definition becomes uh, very relevant. Um, and then finally, uh, to qualify under coverage A, there has to be an occurrence. An occurrence 
um, is an accident, including continuous or repeated exposure to substantially uh, the same general harmful conditions. Um, and again, here we're talking about the element of, of fortuity. Insurance policies don't cover um, things that we know will happen. It covers only things that might happen and that arise out of some fortuitous event, i.e. accidents. Many of the torts that we talked about um, uh, or claims that we talked about are claims that involve some element of um, you know, intentional conduct. And so that raises the question whether, for example, harassment or defamation or um, in, in, you know, employment discrimination claims uh, you know, could be considered um, accidental. So, Dave, there are a number of exclusions under the CGL. Yeah, so, so for those of you who aren't um, sort of uh, in the world of insurance or risk management, um, as Kevin just talked about, that's the insuring agreement, the way a policy is structured. You have an insuring agreement which says what is covered, and then you have a list of exclusions which says even if something is covered under the insuring agreement, um, here are the things that we don't cover. Uh, so as relates to social media and the types of things that we're talking about, we've, we've highlighted some of the key exclusions that may, that may apply. Um, you've got the expected intended injury exclusion. This is really very similar at least in New York, because based on how New York courts interpret um, the occurrence <coughs> requirement, this is very similar to the occurrence requirement. Um, you, there's gonna be no coverage if the harm that somebody is suing you for was expected or intended by the insured. Um, so if, if you um, uh, harass somebody intentionally to cause them mental anguish, then that's the sort of thing that would be excluded under, um, under the expected or intended injury uh, exclusion. Um, and again, the focus is on the harm, not the conduct. And, and the example I like to think about is if I, if I just move my arm like that, um, that was an intentional act. I intentionally moved my arm like that, but if I have no idea that Kevin's standing behind me and I smack him in the face, um, the harm of him smacking him in the face was not intended. Um, and so that would be something that's... Uh, and you can tell he really wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that example in particular. <laughs> I, I just, just one point to that, in, in the context of harassment and bullying, um, there is an inferred intent rule in New York where to do the harm, um, uh, or to do the act is to do the harm. So they, you know, depending on just how closely linked the harm is to the act you're doing, uh, you, you, could, you could argue that you didn't intend to cause the injury, but it would you know, belie the act. So. Yeah, and so a classic example of that is if you drive your car intentionally into a, into a a small building that you know is full of people, um, you, your argument that, well, I didn't intend to hurt the people, I just intended to drive my car into the building, um, most courts would look at that and say, it's so obvious that you would have caused that harm that, that we're gonna assume that you did based on the act that you took. Um, so there's also an exclusion on, under coverage A of the uh, CGL for employer's liability. Um, this would exclude bodily injury to an employee of the insured arising out of and in the course of their employment or performing duties related to uh, the conduct of the insurance business. And really the point of this exclusion is that the, the, the GL policy is not meant to cover uh, suits by employees uh, against their employers. There's other coverage for that, which we'll talk about later, which is the employment related practices um, but, you know, things to look out for here, um, if you encourage your employees to use uh, social media, um, you know, they may, they may be doing that in a way that, that they can later claim some sort of bodily injury. Um, and if you look to coverage under coverage A for that, then there's going to be an exclusion that would, that would bar coverage. Um, another one that, that comes up often in the context of social media, the recording and distribution of material or information in violation of law exclusion. Um, it's, a, it's a mouthful and it's, uh, it basically lists a, a bunch of statutes and says that we don't cover bodily injury or property damage arising out of any of these statutes. And um, one in particular that comes up is can spam, which uh, really was intended to address spam emails that everyone gets uh, all the time and it sets restrictions and limitations on um, what you can do when you send out unsolicited emails. Uh, that's been interpreted by some courts more broadly to apply to social media in addition to just emails. Um, so there's, there's um, you know, potential liability under CAN-SPAM, at least in those jurisdictions that have expanded that. Um, 
if you get sued for a claim under that act and you look to your coverage A of your GL policy, it's gonna be excluded. Um, the other thing of note in this exclusion is that number four is a sort of broad catch-all that says we also don't cover uh, any uh, liability, that, any bodily injury or property damage that would arise under any other federal or state or regulatory act that might possibly uh, deal with the collecting, recording, sending, transmitting, communicating, or distribution of material or information, which is extremely broad. And, um, you know, so we don't know what regulations are gonna come down the road. It seems likely that at least at the state level, if not at the federal level too, there will be more regulations about what people can and can't do on social media um, because there's really been a push for that lately. So um, whatever comes out of that and whatever legislation comes out of that, depending on how that, that legislation is worded, it may fall under this exclusion as well. You, you might wonder why or how somebody came to draft an exclusion as specific as the exclusion that they've just talked about. And it's because the exclusion was not in the policy uh, and, and litigated for years whether these claims were covered under the CGL form, resulting in uh, carriers making a, you know, a decision to specifically exclude it and, and end that controversy. Um, that, that takes us to the second coverage in the uh, CGL form, which is the coverage B. And here, the, the, the insuring agreement um, or promise is to pay those sums that the insured becomes legally obligated to pay as damages because of personal and advertising injury to which the insurance applies. And personal and adver advertising injury is a um, uh, defined term and it includes a number of the torts that we talked about at the, at the beginning. These are claims that are intentional or, or, or quasi-intentional, um, and yet, um, you know, and therefore not, you know, technically um, accidental, I guess, in the coverage A sense, but, but have some element of fortuity to them such that, um, you know, they're covered under this coverage B. So personal injury, personal advertising injury is defined by the policy um, as relevant to our topic today, um, oral or written communication in, in a manner uh, that slanders or libels a person, organization, or disparages goods or products, oral or written publication in a manner um, that violates a person's right to privacy, um, the use of another's advertising idea in your advertisement, and infringing upon another's copyright, trade dress, or slogan in advertisement. Um, so, Obviously, the coverage B is intended to capture some of the claims that, that we've been talking about. Um, and there are um, some applicable uh, exclusions. So first is a knowing violation of the rights of another. Obviously, again, going to that fortuity principle, although these are quasi-intentional torts, you can't really mean to hurt somebody. Um, material published uh, with knowledge of falsity, again, the same principle if you're if you're intentionally um, you know uh, violating you know copyright or, or, or other you're not going to uh, uh, have coverage um, if you're defaming somebody again you're, you're not going to have uh, coverage um, an exclusion for quality or performance of goods failure to conform uh, to statements personal advertising injury arising out of the failure of goods, products, or services to conform with any statement or quality of performance made in your statement. Um, you know, this is obviously an important one um, in the social media context because uh, of the, you know, uh, exponential, you know, growth and use of social media for advertising for uh, the reasons we discussed before. So um, misrepresenting your goods and advertising uh, also excluded. Um, and then, um, you know, wrong description of, of, of pricing, um, also uh, not, uh, not covered. Um, there is an exclusion if the insured is in the business of media and, and, uh, and internet use. In other words, that it's your business to, to produce media content. Um, there are specialty policies, media liability uh, policies that cover that risk. The, the, you know, the general liability policy is not intended to do that, so they carved that out of the coverage as well. And then, um, ultimately, infringement of copyright, patent, trademark, or trade secret uh, exclusions uh, as well. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I would just add there that the, the tricky part here is there, this was litigated for a long time, the, the trademark, whether trademark infringement was covered under coverage B of the GL. Um, and the prior wording uh, of older policies didn't have that specific exclusion in it. Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth and some courts held that trademark infringement was covered. Um, the insurers didn't like that and didn't wanna underwrite that risk. So eventually they put in an explicit exclusion. Um, so what's, what's left under coverage B would be um, uh, claims of trade dress infringement, which is a little bit different as we talked about than, than trademark infringement. Um, and and uh, uh, copyright uh, would be covered but only if it's in an advertisement. So they've sort of narrowed the scope of it, but trade, straight trademark infringement would not be covered. Um, also the product of, of, of litigation um, is uh, exclusions for electronic chat room or bulletin boards um, and unauthorized use of another's name or product. So again, uh, an effort to uh, limit the risk that insurance companies assume for uh, social media related uh, claims. Um, finally, uh, recording and distribution of, of material or information in violation of law. This is parallel to the exclusion we, we just saw in uh, coverage A uh, regarding you know, the, the uh, TCPA claims, the CAN, can Spam uh, Act claims, and, and, and similar statutes. So um, that takes us to our coverage, our CGL coverage takeaway. Right, so um, basically the sort of general takeaway, sort of 10,000 foot overview of, of uh, what the GL policy is gonna cover uh, for social media risks. Coverage A, um, there's, remember it's bodily injury and property damage, so you've gotta have one of those two. Um, there may be coverage for mental anguish claims under coverage A, um, but in order for the claim to be covered, it has to arise from an occurrence, meaning there has to be uh, an accident. It can't be an intentional harm, um, and the focus is on the harm there. Um, coverage B covers these personal and advertising injury offenses that Kevin talked about. They include libel, slander, invasion of privacy, use of the <coughs> advertising idea, copyright and trade dress infringement. Um, there's no coverage for intentional and knowing violations of others' rights, trademark, wrongful description of goods, uh, violation of certain laws, chat bulletin boards, um, these other exclusions that, that Kevin talked about. Um, so some things may be covered, some things may not, um, as far as the social media risks that we talked about. Um, but there's definitely some gaps in a, in a CGL policy that they're not going to cover you for all of these risks. So what other policies might you have? Um, another one would be a cyber liability policy. Um, in, in our discussion here, I'll just caveat the fact that cyber liability policies, unlike CGL policies, are, are not quite standardized. Um, there is variation among them. Different insurers offer you know, different coverages under, under cyber liability policies. They've become more standardized in recent years, but they're not anywhere to, to the level of, of a CGL policy, which is pretty standard across the board. Um, so common coverages, there's a lot of things on here that cyber liability uh, policies cover that don't necessarily relate to, um, to social media, but the one we really wanna highlight would be the, the media liability coverage, um, which again, may or may not be in all cyber policies, but, but some of them do have it. Um, this is the insuring agreement for media liability coverage, at least under, um, here we have, this is I think a Chubb policy um, as an example. Um, and this says the insurer will pay damages and claim expenses by reason of a claim first made against the insured during the policy period for a quote media incident which first occurs on or after the retroactive date so there's a, there's a lot that we could go into about this this is what's called the claims made coverage essentially just um, to give you the, the context for it this policy would cover claims that are made against you as the insured during the policy period um, there's a difference between that and an occurrence policy that we talked about earlier. It's sort of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but, but this policy covers claims that are made against you um, while that policy is in effect. And the key part there is media incident. This policy would cover you for media incidents. Uh, media incident is uh, a very long definition, which I won't read you the whole thing, but essentially it's uh, statements um, or content that you post to your website or on social media. Um, 
if they result in one of those lists of A through G, um, one of those claims. So if you post something on social media that results in a copyright <coughs> infringement claim, uh, then it would fall within the, the insuring agreement of this policy. Uh, and we'll talk about in a minute, there's exclusions that might take it out of coverage, but this is really essentially a list of things that are very similar to the personal and advertising injury offenses that we looked at under coverage B. So there is um, potentially some overlap in, in coverages between the two policies, um, but in some ways it's a little, a little broader than what you would get under a GL. Um, so one thing you wanna pay attention to if you're thinking about getting a cyber policy or you have a cyber policy and you wanna know um, what's covered and what's not, it's always important to look at who is, who is included as an insured on that policy. Um, you're, if you're a business and you've got a cyber, your employees typically will be insured, but often they're only insured for their activities within the scope of their employment. So in other words, if someone sues your employee for some social media related tort, um, they may have coverage for that, but only if what they're alleged to have done was within the scope of their employment. So if you have an employee who goes rogue and starts tweeting out harassing tweets to other people and it has nothing to do with their, their work, um, they're not going to be an insured under that policy. But as the business, if you get sued for that, you, you still would be an insured. Um, so exclusions that might apply, and, and we've just highlighted a couple. Again, this is all very claim specific, so this is the sort of thing that if you get sued, you really have to look at what's alleged in the, in the complaint and compare it to what's in your policy. But some common ones that, that come up um, in the context of, of social media, um, there's an exclusion, they call it the conduct exclusion for dishonest, fraudulent, or criminal acts um, or knowing violations of the law by an insured um, or the gaining, in fact, of any profit for which the insured was not legally entitled. So um, this is a sort of broader concern that I highlight it here because it, it shows up in this exclusion. The exclusion applies to violations of the law or fraudulent behavior by an insured. And there's a difference in the law, and there's a difference in the way the courts treat the words an insured, or any insured, or the insured. And so if you've got a cyber liability policy, and you have an exclusion that says, we don't cover fraudulent acts by an insured, if you have, you're the business, and you have an employee who commits a fraudulent act over social media, um, and you get sued as the company, and you turn to your cyber carrier and you say, cover us, they're gonna say, no, because there was a fraudulent act committed by an insured, your employee. <coughs> Even if you, the business, didn't do that, that exclusion would apply because it's an insured, and the same result would be if it said any insured. But if it said the insured, um, the company would go and say, we want coverage, and they, the insurance company would say, well, no, because it's a fraudulent act. You would say, no, it says fraudulent act by the insured. We are the insured, and we didn't do the fraudulent act so that exclusion wouldn't apply. So it's, it, it's sort of a very, I know it's for, for those of you who aren't in the sort of insurance world, it might be a technical point, but one thing to look out for in your policies is little words like that, you know, when you get lawyers involved in these things and they argue about it and they go before courts, little words like that can end up meaning a lot in what coverage you get and don't. But get. we're on your side. That's right. <laughs> so so takeaway would be more, more protective when you've got wording in an exclusion if it says the insured than any insured. Um, any insured is gonna be a broader exclusion. Um, some other ones, antitrust and unfair trade practices exclusion in this policy. The key takeaway here is this exclusion, uh, if you look at it, and it's very broad. It, it, you know, it mentions some specific acts that, or, um, uh, statutes that it doesn't cover claims under, but it also says um, arising out of uh, any unfair competition, unfair business, or unfair trade practices. So they don't want to cover any claims that arise out of those things. Well, those are potentially very broad, and some of the, the torts that we discussed could fall within them. So, you know, false advertising claims could be an unfair business practice uh, or an unfair trade practice, um, things like that. Um, but then, in this particular example, there are exceptions to the exclusion. So, um, again, we don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but you know, basically, it is important to look at these exclusions. And sometimes there are exceptions to the exclusions, which will bring back coverage. Um, so it's, it's really sort of a claim specific thing, but um, unsolicited communications, this is one to be on the lookout for. This is a very broad exclusion um, that uh, says, uh, we don't cover claims arising out of unsolicited electronic dissemination of communications by or on behalf of the insured. 
So in social media context, that potentially could exclude a lot of things. Um, if someone's sending unsolicited messages to someone over social media, um, you might not have coverage for it if there's an exclusion like that in your, in your policy. So um, exclusions uh, continued. This is another one, insured versus insured. This is, this is important to know because if your employees are insured, um, under the insured versus insured exclusion, they don't cover claims by one insured against another insured. And so if your employee sues you, and your employee isn't insured, there's no coverage for that claim. And again, that's because there's a specific policy that covers claims by employees against employers, and, and we'll talk about that next. Um, false advertising misrepresentation. So again, even though the, uh, the insuring agreement of the cyber liability media coverage is pretty broad and might cover um, some of the, the things we talked about, like false advertising or misrepresentation, there's actually an exclusion for that. Um, and so under this policy, they don't want to cover that. So again, you've got your GL policy that covers some things, you've got a cyber policy that might give you some more coverage, but, but again, there's gaps in that. So false advertising claims, for example, under this policy wouldn't be covered. So a few uh, cyber liability insurance takeaways, pay close attention to who is an insured. Employees may be insured, but not for uh, their conduct uh, outside of the scope of employment. If you advertise goods or services on social media, watch for exclusions or definitions that limit the coverage for claims alleging misrepresentation and description of goods or services. As Dave mentioned, and or any are not the same as the when used in the exclusions. Pay you know, particular attention to that. Uh, be on the lookout for broadly worded exclusions uh, for um, uh, unsolicited communications. And then um, you know, be aware that the insured versus insured exclusion would likely pr preclude coverage for claims made by employees against the company. Um, that leads us to employment related practices, liability insurance. And this again is the, is the, is the key wording or the you know, promise to pay, which is to pay on behalf of the insured for damages in excess of the deductible arising out of any employment related practices to which the insurance applies. Claim is, um, uh, a, a, a written or oral notice presented by an employee or leased worker or temporary worker or fellow employee. The key there being that it has to be you know, made by an employee, not a, not a third party. Um, and employment related practices claims are, are just what you would imagine they, they are. Uh, wrongful refusal to employ, uh, wrongful failure to promote, uh, wrongful um, uh, deprivation of career opportunities, demotions, uh, termination, and, and um, employment-related misrepresentations. Um, so there are, uh, surprise, um, some exclusions. Um, and uh, just to kind of go through them quickly because we're running out of time, um, they are for liability arising uh, under any of the following circumstances. Obviously, workers' compensation and disability, those are covered by uh, separate policies. ERISA, again, um, other policies uh, cover those types of claims, as well as the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act uh, type claims. What's, what's most relevant for our purposes here is um, an exclusion for claims arising under the National Labor Relations Act. Of course, the NLRA uh, uh, protects um, employees who are um, organizing or engaging in concerted activity um, concerning you know, the, the terms and conditions of their employment, um, for example, union organizing, and social media use has become um, a, you know, a place where a lot of that activity you know, takes place. So exclusions um, for you know, protected activity under the NLRA you know, could have a significant, um, uh, or is a significant carve out for you know, uh, social liability related um, uh, conduct. And I just know we pointed out, it's sort of beyond the scope, but there are, there is, there are guidelines that the National Labor Relations Board has put out um, about what you can and can't do with respect to restricting social media use um, of your employees, um, in particular how it relates to their organizing activities and, and communicating about their working conditions. Um, so there's a, there's a link in there And uh, again, you know, this is insurance. There is an accident or fortuity requirement. So uh, 
knowingly false statements um, and claims of false advertising um, or fraudulent acts uh, also are excluded. So some employment-related takeaways, uh, the coverage is likely limited to claims made by employees and potentially board members. Uh, coverage may not include fines and penalties for punitive damages. Um, pay close attention to who the named insured is and how the terms you and your are used in the policy. Um, and finally, you know, claims uh, made under the NLRA may be excluded entirely. Um, so uh, those are some key issues to, um, to be looking out for in your, in your EPL policy. All right, so overall, um, we've talked about a couple of different policies. Um, as I think you hopefully have got a sense, um, there's no one policy that's gonna cover you for all types of social media risks that are, that are out there. Um, you may have a little bit of coverage for some things under your, your CGL policy. You may have some more coverage under a cyber, um, or if it's an, a claim by an employee, you might have coverage under your EPL policy, but there's not gonna be one policy that's going to protect you from all social media liability. Um, and there are certain types of things that no insurer wants to underwrite, and you, you might not get coverage under anything um, for it. So uh, th the best policy that you could have might not actually be an insurance policy. It might be having really good um, social media use policies in, in your work, um, having really good um, you know, employee handbooks that talk about what you can and can't do, um, and, and you know, just being uh, generally proactive when it comes to, to social media uh, in the workplace. Um, and if you happen to be a media company, you know, if you're, if you're a website design company or a, or a content creator and that's your primary business, um, you, you probably wanna consider whether there's a, a specialty product out there that, that might be more applicable to you like a media liability policy. Um, because at least under your GL policy, if that's your business, there's an exclusion that says we're not gonna cover you for any of the coverage B stuff um, if you're a media company. And, and the reason for that is it's, there's obviously a lot more liability potential for a media company when it comes to social media, and so they want to really, you want to target a specific product name for, for those types of companies. So, we've left a few minutes for questions. Do we have any? That was a lot of material, yes. What, what should these policies protect you against these ADA lawsuits that have been popping up? American with Disabilities Act? Yeah. Uh, the employment. Uh, the, the EPL coverage. Well, it, it depends. Are you talking about, about like the wineries? And yeah, the, so I know what you're talking about. I think he's talking oh, about Oh, not in the workplace, the, outside the workplace, the, okay. Yeah, so yeah, your, sorry. your website needs to be ADA compliant and, and, and there's all sorts of requirements about that. Is that what you're, that you're referring to? <coughs> um, so that's, a, that's actually a good question because it's really not bodily injury or property damage. Um, so it probably would not fall under It's not today. covered under the I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would look to the cyber liability policy as a potential uh, first party coverage. Actually, it'd be a third party liability claim um, as, as, as a potential source of, of, of coverage, but I'm not aware that it covers it, so. It may not, and it, and it may fall within one of the exclusions. I, I think cyber would be your, your probably best bet. I, I don't think that there's a personal and advertising injury offense that would apply to that. Um, I'm not aware of any case law on this yet. That's kind of an emerging. So those types of claims are, are fairly new um, and, and we've been seeing a lot of them lately. Uh, so the, the claims themselves are, you know, might work their way through the courts. There's always kind of a lag when we get decisions from the courts on these things. Those claims might work their way through and then there's even more of a lag before the insurance coverage decisions come out from courts because those get litigated usually afterwards. I actually did look at this recently and uh, I, I, I don't recall whether the, the company had a cyber policy so I just don't recall whether I looked at it under a cyber policy but I was unable to find coverage under the under the GL, um, you know, the, the, the standard CGL for it. But it's a good question. So it wouldn't be the same coverage that covers you like for your physical brick and mortar locations or ADA stuff would be so. Well, that would be, a, so I think you're talking about a property policy, right? Well, so, yeah, because there's ADA issues with physical, you know. Well, we're talking about, well, all right, so we were we were talking about the ADA issues that come up with website right. compliance. Yeah, right? so there is there would be different coverage for that versus the physical, you're saying. 
Yeah, but I'm not aware of coverage for ADA compliant buildings. Like I, I, I'm not aware that there's coverage available for, for example, for bringing your your building into compliance with with uh, with ADA requirements. It, those there are might be some third party liability claims that arise out of that, but I don't. It depends. It would have to be kind of a particular claim. Like for example, if somebody said they tripped and fell on the steps to your business because you didn't have an ADA compliant walkway to go up for them to get up, then you know maybe you'd have a bodily injury claim there that would be covered. But but that would just be an ordinary premises claim. Right. But but you know the ADA claims tend to be claims seeking you know some some form of injunctive relief, right? Like you know you have to you know build a ramp um, rather than a claim for for actual damages. Um, and the the standard GL policies don't cover claims for injunctive relief unless the injunctive relief is a is, is, is a, a, a proxy of some sort for for, for damage. So you, uh, that's maybe that's the way the, the, the website wants to watch out if they actually go through a court a court system. Yeah. Well, they are going. They are being. You know, we we do I see cases. Yeah. Settled, I thought. Well, so so this is just anecdotal and and, and I, but from my observation, they it, they're trying to get a settlement because. If you actually litigate a lot of these cases, I don't know that there's money damages that are that are generally going to be available, or at least that would be worth bringing the suits. So they try to get a, a settlement so they can get that, uh, you know, before it goes to the court. I mean, we're defending those cases in our office. We have yeah. we have a group of those cases, and really, it's well, yeah. But I, I think the coverage is tough for, for, for those. Yeah. Would you be covered if you made changes to your website to? Well, that would be a risk mitigation measure, um, but not necessarily something that would lead to coverage where there isn't coverage already. Okay. So, the, so the fact that you undertake some, you know, remedial <coughs> effort on your own to bring a site into compliance doesn't give rise to a covered claim, and you know, ultimately the determination of whether there's coverage is the you know four corners of the of the insurance policy. So they don't, okay. you know, take that. You know, if if, if it were a covered loss. Those sorts of measures would help with underwriting, right? You know that you'd be a more attractive risk if, if, if they were writing coverage for that kind of liability, but um, it wouldn't cause something to be covered for the fact. Okay. We want to be mindful of your time, so if you have any questions, if you were not able to ask our presenters, please do so after. I'm sure your contact information will be available to our attendees. Yeah. Um, and also the PowerPoint presentation, we can email that to you guys so you can have it. Thank you to Ward Greenberg uh, and Kevin and David for presenting. Please give them a round of applause.